Um, for those who don't know, welcome to the Soul Factory Wednesday night Bible study, um, where we've been having our servings, praise the Lord. And um, I'm thankful to be able to um, come and share God's word with you tonight. And um, I really, really miss you all. I'm telling you, I do. I'm telling you, I do. The Zoom thing has been a blessing, but in the same token, it's, 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 it's getting a little bit bittersweet. Um, but um, prayerfully, you know, one day we'll all be in each other's presence again. But um, in the meantime, in between time, as my mother would say, we're going to keep moving on. So um, first, I want to um, let's let's all come under prayer. We've all had a busy day, and I want to make sure that we're on one accord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you, Father God, for today, God. I thank you, Father God, for your word, God. Lord, rest, Father God, and reside on each and every one of us, Father God, your servants who have joined this evening, God, to hear from you. God, they may have had some busy days. They may have had a lot going on, Father God. They may have been outside in the heat, dear Lord. And I pray right now, Father God, that they would be able to get in tune, Father God, and in sync with you, Father God. I thank you, Father God, for the words of my mouth, God. I pray, Father God, that what is said, Father God, would be unto your glory, Father God, and it would be less of Felicia, Father God, and more of you, God. God, I thank you, and I praise you for this evening and for this time that we would bless it, Father God, and you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Like I said, yes, it has been hot today, so um, I pray that you weren't out in that heat too much, and what you had, you were able to enjoy it. So um, for the last um, few weeks, we've been on um, Becoming Peace, and this is part five of Becoming Peace. And, um, you know, I was talking to one of my friends this, you know, this past week, and, um, you know, she, at one point, you know, she was kind of a disciple of mine, and over time, she's kind of just become just a friend, you know, so our, our relationship has navigated in a different way where um, the things that she's saying, you know, I don't always interject, you know, I allow her to just, you know, kind of freely be vulnerable and transparent and share and all those things, and, you know, but every now and then, you know, um, I may um, use a line that I have recently been, been trying to incorporate in, into my vernacular. And um, Mary Cave, our lovely Mary Cave, has said to me a couple of times, and she says, um, may I offer you a suggestion? <laughs> and I love it so much because um, it, it definitely says that I have more to, I have something to say, but you are also free to um, stick, stick on your path. Um, so I did say that to her and she started laughing to my friend and, um, she had kind of alluded to the fact that, um, um, her husband just had asked her, you know, Hey, what's, you know, what's seemingly been going on with you because, um, you've been a little bit distant and seemingly distracted. Um, and he may have just asked it kind of flat in a general question, maybe not with this kind of endearing care that I'm saying it as. And um, she said back to him, you know, I, I asked her, I said, well, what would you say? And she said, I said nothing. You know, I said nothing wrong. Um, and, you know, I just kept listening. And then she said later on that he had sent maybe a text or something that seemingly was a little, you know, edgy, a little spicy. And she responded to that and got really irritated. And so I said, the, the whole may I offer you a suggestion? And I said, well, you know, a few hours passed. He asked you what was what was wrong, and um, and I said, as your friend, I'm asking you. You know, is it because of? And I said these things. You know, that you know her and I have kind of been conversing about over the last few weeks, few months. And she said, yeah, a little bit, that type of thing. So I said, well, why did you tell him the truth? Um, and she was like. Because it, it wouldn't it, it, it wouldn't matter. He, you know, he's not going to be on that page and it, and it wouldn't matter. You know, and I said, well, what made you get on the page of getting irritated when he kind of, you know, got a little edgy with you? And she was like, just because, you know, it's just that, you know, it's just that stuff. I'm just tired of that stuff, you know. And, you know, and, you know, I, and I, you know, I said a few more things in the conversation, but kind of my bottom line was that she had insight to offer to the situation that could have created a different dynamic that could have brought a level of peace, at least in that day, you know, at least in that day, at least in that moment, you know, and I said, you know, he is responding out of a lack of, um, 
relationship, like intimacy, like knowing you. So he responded the way he responded because that, you know, y'all are not thriving at this stage. You're more so just surviving. You know, y'all are surviving marriage, surviving family, you know, and you responded kind of from a, a kind of a hurt nature of my friend would ask me if something what was wrong with me. They would know what was going on with me. And I said, but because you have more information to offer, you could have set a tone that could have created something different. So I said, well, you know, possibly later on, you know, you can go back and say, hey, remember when you asked me this, you know, this is what's going on with me. And to share, I said, because it would reduce possibly some of that edginess, which could be coming from insecurity, could be coming from a lot of different things that he may be offered into the space because he's not in the know. And you were in the know. You have the bigger picture. Um, she said, okay, you know, we moved on, talked about something else. The next day, a few days later, I said, hey, did you ever follow back up with that situation? What, you know, what happened? And she said, no, I didn't say anything. You know, we just started watching TV and moved on. So that brought me back to this kind of becoming peace type of situation. And I said, Lord, you know, and so, you know, you know, Lord directed me to some scriptures in Jeremiah, which I'm going to use today, you know, for, you know, some of our object lessons and, and, and kind of some of the things that we go through when he's asking of us to do certain things and possibly our outcomes could be different. We could set things on a different course, or a different path. We can reset some things. We can do some things different in our space. Um, but seemingly, we are resistant to it. We're resistant to it. So um, can you put up my, um, my first slide? It's coming from um, Jeremiah 25. And, you know, it says, for there's something on my screen that I am going to move really quick to make sure. Okay, it says, for these 23 years from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you over and over again, but you have not listened. Although the Lord has persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets, you have not listened or even inclined your ear to hear his message. You take it down. Almost all this year, I went back at least all the way until February. Could have been before that I know up to February. We have been on the message of peace. You know, it has come in all types of ways, all types of information, um, and through several of God's different prophets. Jeremiah was a prophet. So this is Jeremiah saying this to the Israelites, to God's people. He's saying the word of the Lord has come to you over and over and over again. He has persistently sent his prophets, not just me. He has persistently sent his prophets to you, but you have not inclined your ears to hear. Or he said, you, he said, he said, you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear his message. You know, there's something in counseling that we call active listening, you know, because there's a difference between passive listening and active listening. Active listening is, is, is a focused intention on the speaker, on the message, and in, in hearing and understanding the message, it's acting accordingly to what you hear. That's active listening. Passive listening is just the act of hearing. I hear what I hear. I heard what you said, but there's there's not there's there's nothing else attached to it beyond that kind of that audible you know hearing portion of it. So, um, kind of in looking at you know the the, the the Jeremiah scriptures and even where we are you know in the Soul Factory, I have to believe that. God wants us to continue on this way. But the reason why we're getting these messages about peace is not only because it's important, meaning God is like, I, I need you to get, get to the understanding of this message. I need you to get to the intent of this message. Um, and there's some resistance and why you won't do some of the things that I'm asking of you to do. So just like my friend in that example, her and I've had several conversations about different things that 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 could be done in her household through her in order to possibly create a different dynamic, you know, provide more insight, um, 
um, put more fruit, more seed into the environment, you know, from a, from a positive nature, but she normally, you know, won't do it. You know, she, you know, she, she, she won't go to that, that next level to do. And so, um, I, I, I walk away, you know, looking at it like, um, becoming peace is about making the adjustment. It's about accepting your reality, the reality in which you see, and making the adjustment. And sometimes that can be very difficult because sometimes people think, if I accept the reality that I see, that means it's okay with me. Again, if I accept the reality I see, that means it's okay with me. And in, in the spirit, that's not what that means. That's not what that means at all. It just means that I'm acknowledging that this is what's going on around me. I'm not, I'm acknowledging whether it's in my relationships, whether it's on my job, you know, whether it's in my home, you know, I'm acknowledging what's going, whether it's inside of me, I'm acknowledging what's going on with me. And then in me acknowledging it, my act of listening says, I'm going to have to make some adjustments. Can you go to the next slide? And we're going to be coming from um, Jeremiah 27, verse 2. This is, again, um, the Lord speaking through Jeremiah. It says, thus says the Lord to me, make for yourself bonds and yokes and put them on your neck and send word to the king of Edom, to the king of Moab, to the king of the sons of Ammon, to the king of Tyre, and to the king of Sidon by the messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedadiah, king of Judah, command them to go to their masters, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you, said, say, you shall say this to your masters. Okay, so take it down for a minute. I want, I want to kind of bring some insight. You know, the, the people of Israel were going to go into captivity. They were going to go. They, the Lord was saying, "Hey, you're you're going to go. You're going to go into captivity, and Babylon is going to be your new master." And they were resistant to this understanding. So Jeremiah is saying, "Because you hadn't inclined your ear to hear the message, there had not been no change. There had not been no switch up. You know, the Lord is saying this is what's going to happen." So in that first first part of Scripture, He said, "Make for yourself bonds and yokes and put them on your neck." He said, now I want you to yoke yourself to the understanding of this, to what's going to happen. To, to, to yoke yourself in something is to attach yourself to something, to put a weight on you so that something is attached to you. So he's saying, make a yoke. It's almost like he's saying, make a yoke that, you, you, that you're going to go into exile. You're going to go into captivity. And it's like if someone said, hey, put a, um, put, put a tracker or an ankle bracelet around you um, because you, 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 you about to be locked in. You about to be locked down. You, you're not going anywhere. No, so he's saying you're you gonna have to yoke yourself to this situation, you know, and and in that we have to get to the understanding that some of these situations are the permissible place. They're the they're they're the place that that God has said you are going to be attached to this situation. You are going to be attached to this situation. Can you put the slide back up? Let's go to let's go back to verse four. He's saying, command them to go to their master, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you shall say to this, you shall say this to your masters. I have made the earth, the men and the animals that are on the face of the earth by my great power and by my outstretched arm, I will give it to whomever pleases me. This is God saying this. I have made the earth, put it back up real quick. I have made the earth, the men, and the animals. He said, I've made everything. I've made you, I've made earth, I've made the men, I've made the animals, everything on the face of this earth. And by my great power and by my outstretched hand, I will give it and do with it what I please. Now you can take it down. The Lord is saying, I will permit whatever situation in your life to occur for my purpose. I've made you. I will, I will permit whatever situation in your life for my purpose. And sometimes that's difficult for us to hear because there are certain situations that they seem so beyond us. 
that we don't want to believe that God knows that we're here, that he knows that we're in this space, that he's okay with us being in this space. But he's saying, I need you to bind yourself, yoke yourself, bond yourself to the understanding that you are in this situation. This is your reality. This is your reality. I need you to bind yourself to that, which is the issue with my friend that I was just talking about. She does not want to accept the fact that this is the state of her relationship. This is the state of her home, that she doesn't like the place she's in. So when asked to do, to become peace, to do something different, to, in, it, so to inject some light in the situation, she's resistant because she, she wants to separate herself from the situation. She doesn't want to bind herself to it. She doesn't want, she doesn't want to give herself to it. She doesn't, she, she doesn't want to be attached to it. So it's easier for her to disconnect, even though she's in the situation, even though it's not ideal, it's not what she wants. It's easier for her to disconnect from it than to attach herself to it in hopes that something that she could do would make the situation better. And honestly, I understand. So I'm not coming from a place of lack of understanding. I do, because sometimes we've been in some of these situations for so long that we have done some of these things. We have tried. We have tried to, to, um, to show up differently, to, to, to be kind. To, you know, to, to submit ourselves to the situation so that, you know, we can see something different. You know, we've, we've done a lot of these, these the, the, our due diligence is on these situations, and we are still here. And we're still in these situations. And which leads us to that kind of hope deferred makes the heart sick type of process when, you know, you're, 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 you're hearing the word to do something more, or, you, or it's still what you've done per se doesn't seem like it's enough because change hasn't come because that's your that's your um that's your barometer that you know you know because change hasn't come it's my barometer that this is not working you know um and that's not that's not the lord's barometer you know just because your situation hasn't changed doesn't mean that that he's not in it does not does not mean that he's not he he's not led you to that process for the reasons why he's led you there to get what he wants from you and from the situation. So, you know, I want us to, to, to continue to keep in mind that there is that permissible place. And when we have set ourselves on the path of resistance, then we are either stopped, you know, in the process or we are away. We are away from the process that God has is leading us further away from what he has because there's somewhere he's trying to take us. There's something that he's trying to do. In this situation with the Israelites, he was saying, y'all are going to go into captivity. So get your mind right. You know, get your mind right and bind yourself to that situation. And because I'm God, I'm going to I'm going to allow the situation to occur so that you know it's me. And you know I'm with you. That's why I'm telling you. Matter of fact, he told them in advance. Isn't that a loving God? A loving God that's going to tell you that something is going to occur to you in advance and tell you to get your mind right, to tell you to, to, to see reality for what it is. Don't be resistant because this is happening. But even in that, I'm still your God. That's the type of, that's the type of God that we serve. So, you know, I was, um, <laughs> I, was, I, I was listening, uh, over listening to a conversation my, um, my son and my husband were having. Um, maybe even a week ago, it was, it was pretty recently. And um, my, my son came home from work early. And my husband was like, hey, why are, you, you know, why are you home? Why are you home so early? And he began to tell the story about, you know, something, something, was, something was happening on the job. And, you know, um, because he, he, he really wasn't either able to do what they had for him to do or, you know, something was happening with the system that they, they went ahead and sent him home. He's trying to explain the situation, you know, you know, over and over again to, um, to, to my husband. And, you know, my husband can, can be black and white situation. You know, I'm, I, I can analyze and observe and try to come from this direction and ask a lot of questions to try to process what you're trying to say, you know, give insight. You know, I can kind of go around, around you know, Robin Hood's um, lane. But my husband's pretty much direct, straightforward, and um, black and white. So he said, hey, man, you need to make that, adjust that adjustment. 
So my son said a few more things, but no, you don't understand. You know, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And and watch when they um, you know, they 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 try to get somebody else to do it. Watch, they're gonna have the same, they gonna have the same outcome as I had. Watch, watch, you know. So that's my son said all that type of stuff. My husband said, hey man, you need to make it, you make, you need to make the adjustment. That's on you, you need to make that adjustment. And because I know my son is about to go back into his reasoning, <laughs> um, and my husband is, is cutting him off this, at this point and kind of keeping to that make the adjustment scenario, um, I interjected, you know, and I said, hey, are you listening? And, you know, are you listening to what he says? And that's going to lead me to the next thing. Because in this, this, in this conversation that Jeremiah is having with the Israelites, in the almost the, the 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 very next few verses, the Lord tells them something, and I want you to go back up to um, the next slide. So if those last ones that we ended with were verse five. This is ver verse verse nine. It says, "And as for you, do not listen to your counterfeit prophets, your diviners." your dreams and your dreamers, your soothsayers or your sorcerers who say to you, you will not serve the king of Babylon. Take that down for a minute. In that scenario that I was uh, interjected myself, I became a counter prophet. I became somebody who was saying a different message than the message that was be being sent. Because the Lord is telling them they're going to go in captivity. But he's saying in that next verse, don't listen to when people come tell you that you're not going into captivity. Don't listen to those counter prophets, those people who are coming to, to divide and to, to bring forth a, a different a different information. You know, we've been talking about those the, that, that false shepherding. You know, this this is the, the, the those counter prophets, those false prophets, those who are going to come and tell you something different than what the Lord is telling you. And I wrote, I wrote a, few, um, a few things down about the counter prophets um, because we all have some of those things in our space. And sometimes we're, we, do, we do them unintentionally and we have people in our space who, do, who, who does this to us unintentionally. Um, and it could possibly lead us away from where God is taking us. So go ahead and put the slide back up. And I put some things under counter prophet. It says counter prophets can be those people by word or action separate you from the word, the shepherding message of the Lord. So this could be something that they're saying or doing that is going to shepherd you away from what God has told you. Typically, they may create alternative scenarios where you win by your own hands. <laughs> and it says they can be well-meaning persons who are resistant to your discomfort and provide you theirs, meaning their comfort. Take it down. <laughs> and the reason why the Lord is saying, hey, don't listen to those false prophets. Don't listen to those people in your space telling you, girl, you ain't got to deal with that. Man, for real, she doing all that. You know, uh, you, know you, you, you could be a young person listening to me. You ain't got to listen to your parents. They don't understand. They don't know. They don't know what's up. They don't know what time it is. They don't know what's going on out here. You know, there's always this other, these other messages that are going on at the same time that the word of the Lord is trying to get to you. And unless you incline your ear to hear, to hear the true message, and he says, then, and do not listen in the same, because they're all in the same, in the same boat, and do not listen to the counter prophets, then you, you, you may find yourself getting, getting off the path in which God has you. And the reason why he's saying do not listen to him is because there's, there is still power in the false prophet. It's, it's not the ultimate power. It's not the almighty power, but it has the power to, to move something. Anything that has the power to move something or soothe something or comfort something or change something or interject something, interject a different thought, interject a different idea, you know, anytime it has that, it has a level of power. So he's saying don't listen to that. Don't listen to that because that's not coming from me. That's counter to what I'm saying to you. It's counter to what I'm saying to you. You know, we've had some, I've had some well-meaning people in my life. I remember I had a friend 
who I would say now looking back as I've, I've gotten older and I, I can kind of kind of visualize what I think her gift was. I do believe she had the gift of mercy. And anytime that I was going through back in the day, like especially in my marriage when I was young and you really kind of, you know, ride it out in those kind of those, those early parts of your relationship and your marriage and you have small kids and that type of thing, you know, anytime that I would kind of create the story, the dynamic about what was going on in my home. And typically in those days, in my, in my mind, it was my husband's fault and it was not mine. Okay. He doing this, he doing that. You know, I can't believe this. I can't believe like, he acting like this in the house, didn't that. He's a poor example for the kids. He's doing this, he's doing that. So it was always that type of stuff. And she was so, she was so caring to me. She was so affirming to me. She understood me. You know, and she was, and she she would constantly attempt to comfort me in certain kind of ways, which is why I gravitated to sharing my story, to giving her this information, because she was making me feel good about how I was viewing and seeing and responding to what was happening in my home. You know, and I like that in that scripture, it said, even though this is not what it means, it says, he says, watch out for those soothsayers. S O O T H S A Y E R S. It, it makes you feel like, you know, these people are soothing you, they're comforting you. And to a degree, they are. They are. They're comforting your ego, they're comforting your flesh, they're they're they are uh comforting your fears. You ain't gotta go do that. Even even uh Peter did to Jesus, Lord, Lord, not you, Lord, not you, you're not gonna be crucified. But, Jesus already knew that he was going to be crucified. He already knew he was the Messiah. But there was a counter message in his space that was telling him and that was trying to soothe him. And it was being counter counterproductive to what the Lord was telling him that, Lord, not you, not you. And he had to say, oh, get behind me. You, 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 mean, no, you mean no good to me. You, you mean no good to me. You don't have the things of God in mind. And you know, I, I have I have another friend, and she always says, um, "No, I ain't talk. I didn't talk to you about that. I talked to you about my single friend. I, I talked to that about to my single friends because they understand." <laughs> and, and I say, "Do they understand, or do they say what you want to hear?" You know, that's the difference. Because I got the things when I say this to you, I got the things of God in mind. You know, I don't know what they have in mind, but they may be tickling your ear and saying things to you that are sending a counter message to what God has for you. And in that scripture, God is saying, be careful. Don't listen to these people. Even those people, like I said, who are well-meaning. You may have people in your cell group. This, this, this young lady of mercy was in my cell group who had the gift of mercy. And well-meaning people who, who, who want to comfort you. They want to, they want you to know that they're there for you. But even in that sometimes that you have to be able to say, you know what, let me tell you what God told me. So you have insight into what God told me. So even when I get weak, even when I don't want, I don't want to hear it, even when I feel like the situation has gotten away from me and, I, and, and it's become harder for me to bear under, when I don't want to, when I don't want to utilize the, 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 the messaging of peace and I don't know, I don't want to do the right that I know to do, tell me what the message of God was to me. That, that's someone being your friend. That is somebody who is deciding that they are a brother and sister in Christ to you because they're not going to tell you what you want to hear. They, 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 they are, they are, they're going to, they're going to ride with you, but they're going to ride with you and saying almost like the Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It don't mean you ain't going to go through some stuff, but I'm going to be right here for you. That's what a friend is going to do. A friend that has, has got the things of God in mind. So, Obviously, the Lord knew that because he shared, that's what he said to the Israelites. He, he, he said it right in, in the same breath that he was telling them, this is what's going to happen to you. Don't listen to these people who are going to tell you that's not happening. Don't listen to them because I promise you, <laughs> it is not going to lead you closer to me. So in that, can you put up the next slide? The next slide says, for they prophesy a lie to you, which will cause you to be removed from your land and would, and, and I will drive you out and you will perish. Take that down. <clears throat> listening to that counter prophet, listening to those lies, that's going to take you farther away from where God has you. He says, it's going to remove you from your land. He says, it's going to remove you from your land, from the place that I have you. You know, 
he still has you where you are. You know, you could be on a job. You know, during this COVID, I've heard so many people say, they don't care about us. Oh, I, oh, after all this stuff happened, oh, they don't care about us. They ain't do this, they ain't do that. They ain't tell us when this person came down with something. Um, they made us come back even when it wasn't safe, you know, all this stuff. You know, and you could be in a place, that's your land. That's the place that you are. But God is saying, don't listen to, don't listen to the lies because the lies are going to get you removed from a place that I still want you in. There's still work for you to, to be done there. There's still work in you that I'm trying to do through you there. So you're you're there and you're, you're still there because some of y'all are trying to get out. <laughs> some of y'all say, I got to get out of here. He said, mm -mm, mm -mm, you're not going to be removed from the land. But, but those false prophets will get you to leave prematurely. Those pro false prophets, those counterfeit people in your space, those counterfeit things that are going on in your mind, that will get you to leave a situation prematurely before you have gotten what the Lord intended for you to get out that situation before he did. And that's the part that you have to be careful with. You do have that. That's why these messages of peace are so important because peace grounds you. Peace grounds you in a certain kind of way that, 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 that has you to be still enough to hear, to be still enough to figure out what's going on inside of you and around you. That's what peace does. But when we are in that kind of responsive, impulsive mode, when we are in those situations where we don't like and we think because we don't like it, that gives us permission to get out of it, that, 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 that's when we potentially the, the, the purpose and the intent that God has for us is not going to come to fruition because we're operating, we're operating off of the, the, the me first mentality. If I don't like it, if it's not going to work for me, if I'm not getting what I want out of it, if I perceive something with my eyes and what I see, if I perceive something and it's not the way that I think it should go, then, then, Hey, I'm going to have to, you know, exit this situation, you know, and that happens even a lot in our relationships. We can exit physically, meaning we can leave. You can walk away out your home. You can walk away from your marriage. You can disconnect yourself from your older your your older kids. Sorry to disconnect yourself from the younger kids, though. But you can disconnect yourself from your older kids. But you can also leave and still be in the same place. Like my friend, where you're there, but you're not there. You're not all there. You're not giving of yourself anymore. You're not doing anything in, anymore. You're not creating anything that would that would that would build on the dynamic in a better way, because you have you've decided that you you are no longer going to adjust and attach yourself to that situation, and it's something that you don't like, and so you you want to be resistant to it. So, in that in that um, in that scripture that Jeremiah twenty seven that we were just reading that for they prophesied a lie to you which will cause you to be removed far from your land you know you don't have to be removed from the place that God gave you I mean I, I really hope you understand that God's people I don't care the state of your situation you don't have to be removed from it in order to see goodness out of it in order to get goodness in order to believe something you don't have to be removed from it you know but 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 you listening to other things outside of you and not following through what God says to you, I believe that God has given us all a message. Right now, he's given us the message of peace. He's given you all a personal message, too, about your situations because he doesn't leave us in the dark. Even like when he was talking to the Israelites, he told them what was going to happen even before it happened. So if you seek him with your whole heart, then you'll find him. So I believe that many of us have sought God and we, and he's given us a word for us, you know, a word for our situation. We've all been in seasons where, you know, I know God's word for me in this situation. Sometimes it's a hard word, you know, but even in then he may say, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you to remain in this situation and do what I'm asking of you to do, because I believe that there's something more beyond what you see. There is something more beyond what you experience. And that's the place that he has us. Can you go to the next slide, please? It says, but the nation which will bow its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, that nation I will remain on its, that nation I will let remain on its own land, says the Lord, to cultivate it 
and to live in it. You can take that down. You know, becoming peace is going to require you to be a servant to that situation. Becoming peace is going to require you to be a servant to that situation. And that scripture, he says, you're going to have to serve the king of Babylon. You have to serve that situation. That's what it's going to require. It's going to require you to be a servant. And I know that's hard to hear because most people want to say, but you don't understand. You don't understand what's happening. You don't understand what I'm experiencing. No, I don't understand. But I know that God does. And I know that if he's asking us to serve our situations, he's asking for us. He said, he said, serve the situation so I will let you remain on your own land, says the Lord. So I want you to hear that God is saying this. He said, and then I want you to cultivate it and live it. You know, and let me tell you why that's so important. <laughs> The beauty of what he's saying is he says, I want, I don't want you to cultivate somebody else's land. I want you to cultivate your land. Okay, put, put the slide up so we can read what cultivate means. He's saying that when he said, I want you to cultivate it, it's the, it's the previous slide. He says, I want you to cultivate it and live in it. It says to improve upon its state, to prepare it for growth, a future harvest. He said, I want you to remain on your own land. I'm going to let you remain there. I'm going to let you remain, but it's on your own land. So you are not investing in something that's not yours. You can take it down. You are investing in what's yours. He said, I want you to cultivate your land. I want you to improve upon it. I want you to improve upon it for future growth, for a future harvest. Can you see that? That's, that's the service to the land. That's the service to your place. That's the service to your home. That's the service to your relationship. That's the service to your job. He said, I want you to improve upon it. He said, I want you to improve upon it and because it's yours. Because if you improve upon anything that's yours, you're going to reap the benefits of that. It's like in the world when they, when they call it sweat equity. Okay, sweat equity is using your own labor to invest in your own property for you to get the value from it. It's sweat equity. So God is telling you, I want you to use sweat equity in your situation to improve upon it. I'm giving you your land. It's yours to cultivate. And I want you to live on it. But I want you to improve the state of the land by your service to it, by your sweat equity for it. Because right now you want a fixer upper. If any of y'all watch these HGTV TV shows, you are in a fixer upper. There's a show on a fixer upper that the two guys they move in to the rundown house that they're going to fix up. Some of these people, you know, they go out and buy the house. You know, they live in a some nice house in some other part of California somewhere else. Then they fix up the house. You know what I mean? They just keep coming to visit it, do this, do that, do this, do that, and then they they step out. These particular gentlemen, they buy the house. It's in a maybe I think in a rundown neighborhood, like in Detroit. You know, Detroit has, you know, you know, it has seen some better days. And they buy the house. They 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 are still involved in the neighborhood and they live in the house. And in that, they are fixing up the house. So to sell it to somebody else, to gain value to sell to somebody else who wants to improve that neighborhood who's a part of this revitalization project. So you were in a fixer-upper, and it's yours. You moved into it. You live there. God said, you can't leave. You live there. You are bound to it. He said, I need you to make the adjustment and start utilizing some servitude so that you can cultivate this land for future growth for a harvest. You can get the value from it because there's value there. I know that there's value there. But you know what? Because sometimes we fear things so much, we fear what's going on so much that instead of us saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to submit to this process. We resist it because what we think we're going to lose in submitting to it. So move to the um, next slide, please. So in this process of the Israelites going to go into Babylon, there were some articles of the Lord still in the Lord's house, meaning God has his own stuff. There's some stuff, there's some stuff of value 
in his house. So this scripture says, yes, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the articles which remain in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem, they will be carried to Babylon and they will be there until the day that I visit them. I'm going to take it down for a second. He was saying that, because they, they're pointing out, we can't possibly be going to go into who to exile because even some of the stuff in the it, it, some of the idols stuff in the Lord's house it's gonna be it's gonna be taken too it's gonna be lost too <laughs> and God is saying yes yes because as much as you care about care about that stuff I care about it more as much as you care about your children and now you're saying you know what I don't know I don't know because if, if if I stay in this situation and do this, I don't know what's going to happen to this. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And and I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this. As much as you care, God cares more. As much as you care about you, God cares about if you're in a covenant and you're in a relationship and you say, I don't know, I'm fear and saying this is just doing too much for me, that type of thing. He cares about his stuff more. He cares about his covenant more. He cares about his bride more. He cares about it more. And so he said, I know that those things are valuable. And if I tell you you're going, and, my, and I'm saying my stuff is going too, I care more than you care. So I'm, I'm obviously going to take care of those things too. That's my point. I'm obviously going to take care of those things too. Can you put the slide back up? We're going to start with verse 22. That same, that same um, slide. It says, they will be carried to Babylon and they will be there until the day that I visit them, my favor. I said, they're going to be there until the day I visit them with my favor, says the Lord. Then I will bring them back and restore them to this place. You could take it down. <clears throat> when, he, when, when he says that they are going to, you are going to be in this situation and all the stuff that you value, everything that you value, because you, you're thinking you're losing something and it's scaring you. So then you hold on tighter. You become more resistant. And he's saying, if you, if you submit and you let it go, you let it go. All that you say, you're trying to hold on to so tight. If you let it go, he said, I'm, I'm going to let that stuff stay there. But it's not lost. It's not to your, to, to its end. It's mine too. And in that, when I come back to visit, I'm going to come back and get my stuff too. But I'm telling you to serve this lane. I'm telling you to not be resistant. I'm telling you to cultivate this space. I'm telling you to do that be because of the level of value that is. I know it's valuable. I know it's I know that you're valuable. I know that you're valuable. And I'm not I'm not leading you into disaster. I'm I'm leading you into a, a, a state that's going to create more value. You're going to get a harvest from this. I'm leading you into that. And you have to trust me that this is my permissible place. And stop resisting. Stop resisting it. Resisting my word. Resisting my message. When you're in this situation, sometimes, sometimes we're on it. And other times it's just like, okay. <laughs> and and you have to recenter yourself that God, you are still here. And if you've placed me here and you are in me, then in me and through you, I can do this. I can do what you're asking of me to do. I can become peace. I can, I can give of this light that you've placed in me. And I don't, it doesn't have to be up. It doesn't have to be darkened. It doesn't have to be snuffed out. That I, I have to truly believe that. So Let's 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 move on to the to the next scripture because this one this one's called serve and cultivate it. Because there's some there's some there's some real there's some real steps that you know we must take in order to um in order to do what God is telling us to do. And he and he really does outline them um in this scripture years ago blessed me so tremendously and just this is my state of kind of familyhood and growth and it says so says the lord of hosts the god of israel to all the captives whom i have sent into the exile from jerusalem to babylon build houses and live in them plant gardens and eat their fruit take wives and have sons and daughters 
No, it says take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters into marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not in, and, and do not decrease in number. Take that down for a second. So for all those things, he's saying this, okay? He's telling, he's saying, when you go into this space, and he's telling, telling this to each and every one of us, when you go into this space, I want you to build. That's what he told them. He said, I want you to build. He said, I want you to put that work into, like, well, you, like, like we just said a little while ago about this sweat equity. I want you to live there. I want you to invest in the space that you're there. I don't want you to take yourself away. I don't want you to separate yourself. I don't want you to take that light away. But I want you to invest in this situation. I want you to invest in that place. That's what he said in those first things when he said that you were going to uh, build houses and live there. Then the second thing he says, I want you to plant gardens and eat their fruit. He said, I want you to plant new seeds. And I want that, and I want those seeds. And I believe, because there's a reaping and sowing process, that those seeds are going to bear fruit. And when they bear fruit, enjoy it. That anytime you can eat something, you're enjoying it. So it says, he says, uh, and 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 eat their fruit. So plant gardens and eat their fruit. Eat their fruit. That's a that's an act of you now you've done something and it's come. <laughs> I remember in situations where, you know, maybe I've done I've done something to kind of create a a, a lighter energy in my home in the past. <laughs> And you know we don't struggle with this now. And then my husband may crack a joke, and then I I wouldn't laugh because it was already something in my mind that I don't like him like that. I don't fool with him like that. So you know, even though I'm doing the work to create a different environment, when I then start seeing the harvest or the fruit, you know, things are lighter. You know, we starting to act like that we're friends and we enjoy one another. I didn't want to respond to it. That's when, it, that's when you're not enjoying it. You're not eating the fruit, like God said. You're not enjoying it. You know, if someone laughs, you can laugh. You can laugh at the joke. <laughs> you can't laugh. But there's something in us that won't let us do it because we don't think that we should be enjoying something that we've decided that we don't like. And we don't realize that the point of this is for us to get something back. If you're planting seeds and there's a reaping and sowing process and you're expecting a harvest and the fruit comes, Enjoying the fruit is your gratitude to the Lord. Lord, I am thankful for this fruit today. It may not happen every day. Every day, it may it, it may not feel lighter. There it may not be a, a, a feel like there's a refreshing. But the times that, that that they are, even if they're far and few between, even if they're far and few between in your situation, enjoy it. That's saying, God, I see that you have brought fruit, and you're the Lord of the harvest. You are the Lord of the harvest. And you know what? If there's times, there's, there was times in my situation where I said, "Today, God, I just need, I need to see you. I need to see some fruit. I need to see you." And those would be the times that my husband would do something that was out of, at that stage out of character, you know. And I felt like it was God reflecting, breathing, breathing new life on me, you know, showing me that He loved me and He was with me in the situation. I could feel that. And if you, if there's times in your life that you get to that point where you're saying, I know I keep putting these seeds in the ground and they have yet to harvest, they have yet to harvest, God, I, can you send me something today? Ask the Lord of the harvest to send you a refreshment today. And when he does, just turn and say, God, thank you. Thank you, Father God, for that favor. Thank you for showing me that today, because I know that means God is with me. You are with me. And then in that scripture, he was saying, you know, that form some new connections and some notes, some new relationships just in your space, especially if you have a lot of counter prophets in your space, you know, that you have just gotten in the habit of um, being able to complain more with them being able to soothe you and comfort you in a certain kind of way. He said, form new relationships or establish boundaries in the, in the ones that you have so that you can, you can build something new in that space. Like you going into this space, it means that that's the, you're actively having to cultivate something new, create something new. And that's going to look like things that are happening in your situation and things that are happening around your situation. Because you've invited certain situate people and in, 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 in conversations and ideas into your situation. And so now, now you, you have to figure out what to do with all that. 
because it's going to be hard to become peace. It's going to, it's going to be hard to keep setting your mind on, on peace when you have all these other things that are creating these counter dynamics that take you and distract you and make you turn your head, make you feel, feel that you don't, you, you shouldn't have to deal with this. You don't have to be in this situation. This is not God. He, he would never want you to, 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 to be in that situation. Well, who says? Did God say? What was his message to you? Who says? Because there are some situations where we can kick the dust of our feet and we can walk. And if God told you that, so be it. But if he told you to stay, if he told you to serve your land, if he told you to cultivate a, a, a new existence, then that's the word of the Lord for you. And in that, the only way to become peace is to make the adjustment, as my husband would say. You will have to make that adjustment so that you can do that so that you can be on God's page. You can still continue on the path that he has you so that he said you can cultivate that land and live in it because I'm going to give you the fruit of it to enjoy. That's my, that's my good promise to you. Pull up the next scripture, please. And he says, for thus says the Lord. It's the next one after that. For he says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years of exile have been completed for Babylon, I will inspect you and keep my good promise to you to bring you back to this place. Take it down. Uh-oh. I'm going to inspect you. You not. Nobody else is looking at this. God says, I'm going to come back. After some time has passed, I'm going to come back and, ins and inspect the word active word the, the the listening to what i say and the 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 activation of the message i'm going to come back and inspect that and he says when i inspect it he said and it, i will visit and inspect you and then i will keep my good promise to you bring you back to this place so there will be some time that's going to pass be patient wait on the lord wait on the lord but he says i'm going to come and i'm going to inspect the work I'm going to inspect the land. I'm going to inspect the value that you have that you have inserted into this space because now you're looking at it like this is a desolate land. This isn't this isn't something that God can't resurrect. But I'm going to have to do something to bring new life to it. And that's going to have to begin with me. I'm not saying he didn't give a message to somebody else in your home or on your job, even with your employer. I'm not saying that he didn't say that. But what I am saying is that there's going to be a part that he's going to inspect that's just personal to you. That's just personal to you. And you go back to the previous slide, not this one, but the previous one. It's going to be the Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. Just going to, oh, the serve and cultivate that slide. Yes. Let's read the bottom of that one. It says, seek peace and well-being for the city where I have sent you into and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its peace, its well-being, you will have peace. Take that down. Have you ever been on a job that you have decided that there is a lot going on here and you don't know if you have a place here? The, your, the, the management, the, the people are getting on your nerves. They, they, they're dysfunctional from leadership down. And, you know, you, 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 you just don't know where you fit that you can keep doing that. Okay. God's saying, seek peace and well-being for the city where I sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its peace, its well-being, you will have peace. Oh, that blessed me, that blessed me years ago because I was in that type of situation. And when I began to pray for the institution, pray for the leaders, pray for the managers, when I began to insert myself to cultivate that land that I was in and seek its peace, its well-being, because he, God says, if it prospers, you're going to prosper. If it prospers, you're going to prosper. So I want you to pray for it. I want you to pray for that person who's despitefully using you. I want you to pray for that organization. I want you to pray for these situations because in its well-being, you're going to find peace. 
you're going to find peace. I remember I used to have this manager and she was so head smart, but every head smart person may not need to be a manager of people. That's the only way I can say that. And she would frustrate me to no, to no end, you know, because I could see and observe. You, you don't know how to govern yourself with people. No matter what knowledge you got, you're not going to get what you want out of me or anybody else because of how you showing up, you know, and, you know, no matter how, how in advance I would meet her deadline, or her deliverable, she would wait till the last minute to, to uh, review something and then give it back to me. And then I would have to stay. This was during those public accounting days, you know, when um, you work in those 70, 80 hour weeks. And I would have to stay until midnight, 2 a.m. to get the stuff turned around because maybe it was due to the client the next day. And then when we would get caught up in these emails between her and I, or maybe her, her boss or leader would be on it, I was very antagonistic, you know, um, very defensive. Because in very, you know, I would point blame because in my mind, oh, I did my part. That's her. That's her. This is the reason why we in this situation. Oh, so I may not say it that direct. I may say, well, I did turn this project in um, two weeks ago. You know, unfortunately, in getting it back yesterday, you know, we are behind schedule. You see that? Okay. I became convicted over time and how I was utilizing my light or darkness, however you want to look at it, in, the, in that organization and with that person. Because it, it, it created levels of dynamic. It created problems with her. It created problems in the leadership line. It created morale issues for the team because it was like, man, you know her. It was always like, no, because we worked on, you could switch jobs. So nobody worked for the same manager, supervisor all the time, depending on the project and job you work, then you could get switched up. So, you know, so the word on the street is this, you know, this person, she's unorganized, you know, she's going to do that last minute stuff, X, Y, and Z. But I was doing that. I was creating these dynamics. And when I got convicted, God said, all I want you to do is when she sends you an email, because I would go back and forth for her, I would always send her emails like, is this ready yet? I sent this to on this date. Is this ready yet? This, you know, um, he would just say, he, well, he just said, all I want you to say is, sure, no problem. Because that's all I can muster up because of how much disdain I had for the situation, how much it bothered me. You know, I, you know, I was, I felt disrespected. I felt like you don't care about people. You got people up here all night long when you had this stuff, you know, it was all, I had already created this inner dynamic where I hated the situation. So I was resistant really to any form of change and wanting to do anything different in the situation, but I could still hear from God. I knew that this, this, you know, you know, Satan can't cast out Satan. I knew enough to know, know I don't care how basic of what, what it was. And this was uh, 20 years ago. I knew enough to know, oh, I'm out of tune and out of, I'm out of line. So all I could do, though, to get across was just say, no matter what she said, I said, sure, no problem. So can you take care of X, Y, Z? Now it's, it may be 8 p.m. at night. And I know it's going to take me three hours to do this. Sure, no problem. To the point where one day she came to me and she said, I don't know. She said, she, she had never said this. She said, some to the some to the degree of, I know I can be difficult and unorganized and seemingly flighty. I know you ask me a lot of questions and I normally just don't give you the why we're doing something. I just tell you to do it or tell you to research this and then I never come back to you. But I appreciate you working with me. That was the first time, and I probably had been dealing with, with this woman for a year and a half. You know, that was the first time that she had ever highlighted the deficiency. And, and I, I just said, you're welcome. And then the next time I had, and I had my review, because the, the, the first time I had my review, our, my review was so combative with her, we had to end the, we had to end the review. Because I was like, oh, I don't agree, I don't agree, I don't agree. You, 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 you. This next time I had my review, I just sat and listened to her. And then and then I apologized. I said, I just want to apologize to you for how I was acting before. 
you know, I, I don't think it's right. I don't think you should have to deal with that from any employee. Um, I appreciate, you know, and I said, you know, your knowledge and your this and your that. I said all that stuff. And then soon thereafter, a management position came available and she recommended me for it. And in that life lesson, like I said, that was 20 years ago, 20, maybe 25 years ago at this point. In that life lesson, God showed me that, you know, how you are going about getting things is not going to be to my desired end. Because what did he, what did he want to teach me? He wanted to teach me humility. He wanted to teach me grace. He wanted to teach me to, to make the adjustment. That's what he wanted to teach me. But I was so young and outspoken and I know I knew it all and I knew what was, she was doing one right and all those things. It ain't about right and wrong all the time. It's not about right and wrong all the time because that's not going to be your excuse because they were wrong. This is why I did this. It's not about that. It's about what is God telling you in the situation and where does he want you to grow? How does he want to be able to show up differently in that space through you? in order to get, get you to, to your desire then, in order for you to cultivate that land and get some value from it. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just about that. I want to go to, I think the next slide. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the becoming piece, the impartation. This is our last slide. Now, stumbled upon this because in that first scripture, when God talked about it, take it out real quick, I'm sorry. In that first, that, that, that previous scripture, when, and when God talked about, I'm going to, you can take it down real quick. I'm going to inspect, I'm going to, after you do all this, I'm going to come by to inspect you. And then I'm going to give you my good promise. I'm going to come by to inspect you. You know, when God led me to this next scripture that we're going to read, I was, I was, I was really blessed because I don't think we see we don't, we don't see in us becoming peace that we're creating something. We're creating something, something for the Lord. So put, put, put up that next, that next slide, this next slide. It's called Becoming Peace, the Impartation. It says, you know, this is from the CJB version, and then we're going to, we can read the NIV version, which is below. It says, I heard a voice from the throne say, see, God Shekinah is with mankind and he will live with them. They will be his people, and he himself, God with them. They, he will be, it, God with them will be their God. And it says Shekinah, his dwelling place, the glory, his divine presence. Take that down. Why that blessed me, it says that, see, God Shekinah is with mankind. You know, it's with me. You know, it's, it's through me. You know, we are a lot of times waiting for God to show up. And he's saying, well, you're my glory. You're, I'm going to show up through, through you. You know, so you're not waiting on me. I'm waiting to show up through you. So he's saying, you're my dwelling place. So the only way that God can be your dwelling place is he's, he's going to gravitate to the, to the purification He's going to gravitate to what has been cleaned out. He said, I'm going to come back and inspect the land. I'm going to come back and inspect that it's clear, that it's clean of all these things, that, it, that, that it's been refined. I'm going to come back to do that. And when I do that, I'm going to rest there. Now it's my new dwelling place. It's my new dwelling place. And when God dwells with you, now when he says, I'm going to bring my favor, like in that previous scripture, he's going to bring his presence. He's going to bring his favor. He's going to bring all, all that that we're saying that we want because now we've created a place for him to dwell. We've created that place. You can uh, pull up the NIV version just so that you all see that it says the same thing. It's just in plain language. It says, and I have heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell in him. So he will dwell with them and they will be, and I'm going to say his, his true people and God himself will be their true God. Put, take it down. This process about come, this process about becoming peace is about making yourself a dwelling place for God. 
so that he can come and impart his presence in you. He can now be, be, be injected in your situation because now you, you have made room for him because you have become peace. You have cleared the way for him. You've made room for him. And now he can come and rest and reside there. He can bring his presence there. You can see the fruit of the spirit. You can see now his love. You can see that kindness and gentleness pervasing all over the place. You can see self-control in you and through you and through and, and other people in your space. You can see that gentleness. You can see all of those things because now God has embodied mankind through you, through the place that you have made for him so that he can now do his work. He can, he can, he can invoke favor on your situation. So as we continue on this journey of peace and hopefully us becoming peace, we realize that the message, when we start talking about, he said, I'm telling you this and sending my prophets, my prophet Jill and my prophet Duran, and, and my, we've heard from Will and we've heard from Ed and we've heard from Dave and we've heard from Felicia and we've heard from Devereaux. We've heard uh, when, when, when we've had the, uh, the, leadership, the, the leadership training, my prophets have been sent to you and, and they have said the same thing over and over and over to you. I just want you to incline your ear to hear the message. Of, the message of peace is that I want to visit you. And I want to come and I want to work things out in your situation. But I need you to make room for me. I need you to make room for me. And when you make room for me, I'm going to bring my favor. I'm going to work that situation out. Not only did you cultivate the land, you're going to live in the land, but you're going to get the harvest from it. You're going to get the value from that land. You don't have to leave your home. You don't have to walk away from your, situ your, your, your job. You don't have to quit and not have nothing because they're driving me crazy. You ain't got to lo lose your mind because some people say, oh, this situation going to make me lose my mind. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. When you become peace and you allow God to come in that situation, he's going to clean all of that up because his very presence is going to bring light and life to that situation, but it's going to happen through you. Amen? Amen. We're going to go ahead and pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, God, I thank you for your word, Father God. I thank you, Father God, for coming to visit us, God, and sending your prophets to us and sending your word to us, Father God, and speaking to us, Father God. I pray that everybody had an ear to hear, Father God, heard your word, Father God. Father God, and they heard your message and they would implore God, act of listening, God, in order, Father God, to make the turn, to make the adjustments, God. Give us the courage and the strength, God, to make the adjustments, Father God. Refresh us, Father God. Refresh each and every one of us and send us, Father God, send us just, just, just a, a new sense, Father God, that you are there with us. God, be with us, Father God. God, I thank you for your heart of your people, that they've tuned in to hear from you, Father God, that they are submitted to you, Father God, that even, Father God, in any difficult situation that they're in, Father God, they, Father God, would know that you have permitted it, Father God, and that your grace is sufficient, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for continuing to keep us, Father God, and to care about us, Father God, and to guide us and lead us into your purpose. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.